Okay, the questions I was musing about at the end of uh, the last video, it's obviously the trade in progress is where you're going to be getting the progress track. You get that if you succeed in the trades, right? And you might get up to three levels of progress off that. So that's the way the game moves forward. Well, it wasn't clear to me. Again, you know, the rules do a horrible job of giving you any idea of what the game's about. Um, and I feel like you have to kind of play it through or have somebody explain it who isn't, who does know, rather than uh, who's looking at this. So, my uh, first player is over here, and the guy with the I can seize the turn doesn't want to do that. In fact, he didn't want to do it on the first turn either. He didn't want to spend that big card, is basically what it comes down to. He's not too miserable with what he got. So, these guys have the Guptas, and that means I can start something over here in Hyderabad, and that's near an elephant, and I hear elephants are the key to the whole game, according to Gregor. So, uh, I guess that's what I want to do. Um, now, having a second empire seems valuable. But then the question is, and uh, I put my action down. The question then is, well, what is my action for this empire? This is my free action that I get because I don't have as many empires as, uh, as my maximum. Well... I look at my other cards, and at least in terms of, uh, I can't play any of these three artifacts. I don't, you know, paying attention to everything on the cards is beyond my ability. But this other one, the Buddhism, I looked that up. Uh, I'm not eligible for that, at least not over here where I'd be playing it, because you have to be within range of India to take Buddhism as your religion. So I'm not going to do that. So I'm left with kind of a, well, what do I want to do? Uh, to some extent, I might want to expand, but not terribly. I mean, if I can get the whole, if I can be the biggest empire in the world, that'll help. Right now I'm the second biggest. Um, but in order to expand, I'm going to need more cash, and more cash will probably get me higher up on the money track here, maybe get me to first place. I do need to be in first place to get any victory points from money. So that's a, a, a possibility. Other options that I could do here? Well, I could do the trade in progress. I'd be trading against the deck because I'm not near anyone and try to push my uh, progress marker forward. The problem there is I have a trade of minus one. Seems unlikely that I'm going to get much gain off that. You know, uh, so we're not going to see North America or South America become kind of the technological leader in the world. Um, I can't produce without money. Maneuver isn't going to help me. Destiny, I could get more cards. Civilize is of interest, but mainly because I'd want to play the event cards. Otherwise, well, I could grab some leaders and maybe I'd get something that helps me that way. But without, uh, without, an event, without an artifact card, that seems unlikely. I haven't, you know, maybe I'll look at these event cards. Glory pour moi. Okay, so this I can play on any turn and just say, only this country gets glory. That sounds to me like a late game thing, but this is a high value card, and I may not want to hold England and France all game. I may choose to use those cards for their effects instead. What about Plague? Pick a controlled area. Let's try to get this under some kind of light that I can read it in. Uh, draw a card. If the card is less than the number of the target empire's age, you remove units, leaders, or reduce the city in the area by the difference. Now perform the same check in an adjacent area. Continue until a check fails. You can't pick a neutral area or the same area twice. So this would be kind of a powerful card to, you know, swing through this area where there are a lot of players in place. So that's kind of appealing as a possibility for the civilized action. This is the only time that I can play that. And then Schwerpunkt is going to be a combat card, obviously. Anything else on Civilized that I'd want to be able to do? I can't adopt a religion or government. Modernizing, that's something you can only do if you've advanced already. So uh, 
urbanize, I could build more cities. That would give me more income, but... And remove disorder doesn't sound like an issue. So what I'm going to go with is the production um, option. Uh, of course, i got to pay maintenance on my units and then build more units. But at the very least, that'll allow me to get this. And then on the next maneuver, maybe I can be the biggest country in the world. That's a lot of thinking about one person. I probably don't want to do this much, uh, you know, before the camera or with the camera any more in the game. I just wanted to give the kind of thought that you have to make as you're making your decision of what actions you're going to be taking each turn. Now, if my mind changes drastically, if I notice new and exciting things, yeah, I'll jump back in and go to the detail. But for now on, I'm going to try to go for more of a just try to capture the story of the game rather than every detail of every decision because there are a lot of decisions in this game um, and here's the thing unlike a euro there's more than just the decisions there's something interesting happening too there's cultures rising and falling and everything uh, so although the decisions are very very heavily uh, they require a great deal of thought and, and ha may heavily influence your position in the game. There's so much more to the game that's of interest that let's just push those stupid gameplay decisions out of the way and get to the story that the game provides. It's hard not to talk about something after you've just thought about it. So one thing that I'm thinking is, okay, great. This guy had an easy choice. Start a new empire and produce money. Most of the others may not want to produce money as much because they haven't spread out yet. So, so most of these empires need to take a maneuver action to spread out. But even that can come under, you know, other choices are still available. Maneuvering, getting a big empire may not be your goal in this game. It's not like history of the world in that the only thing that you can, you kind of want is to control territory. So as an example over here with the Chams, they don't have another empire. So their non-empire card pretty much is forced to be a destiny. That's going to allow them to at least fill out their hand, even if they don't want to discard cards. But they could also discard some cards and get some stuff. But they have an interesting card here. Well, they have some interesting cards. They could do bad things to other people. So notice all... Uh, um, maybe I'm lying. Okay. So, if I do the civilized action, there's a number of things that can happen here. Among them, artifacts. Now, I don't have any artifacts I really want. Confucianism, you know, these religions just don't impress me too much. They provide you with a certain amount of defense in that you make it unpleasant for uh, at least Confucianism and whatever, the Buddhism that I had, uh, that make it unpleasant for other people to conquer you because you end up with disorders if you conquer them. But um, that's the only thing I could play there. I also have this forum, which is kind of neat. And I was reading it, and now I went and read something else. That one's kind of even more impressive. Um, an empire can put a plus one to go marker. Uh, okay, an empire with forum can convert their action into a pass if they don't like the action they have anymore after they see the circumstances. And they get a plus one to go marker. And that means when they take an action some other time, they can get immediately after that a free additional action of any type except the one that they just played. So, you know, if you uh, if you do say a production action, uh, you can also do a maneuver immediately afterwards and spread out from it. So that's kind of an interesting thought. But uh, what I ended up choosing is actually to do the trade in progress. My trade ability. I've got this E, which I don't know what that stands for, but it seems to be maybe this special, which is that I earn income from a winning trade equal to the difference between the trade values. So if I can win a trade, and I think my range is such, let's see, what color am I? I'm purple. I think my range is only two, uh, which means I'm probably not going to be in range of another empire, but I can draw from the deck. 
And if I, I can play a good enough card, I can maybe get some extra cash as well as go up level and, well, I lose my card, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> and what I'm looking at there is I have at least one card that I wasn't terribly impressed with. Uh, I don't remember. The Sumerians here maybe with their five points. Uh, or maybe the pirate state with four. They just don't seem terribly valuable uh, to me. So it seems worthwhile to try to improve my position like that. Um, but there are just so many different options with each player at each moment that it's kind of painful. Anyway, I'll put this here to remind me where I am so I can take an actual break because this game is very fatiguing with the play, the card play situation. Right, so somewhat in a naive way, I've filled out all, everybody's selections. Everybody's got one counter for their non-imperial action and one on their umpires. I don't know how it's going to work out. There is the problem, though, where I have to reveal what everyone shows. So... You know, basically, I'm going to have to be going around the table and again and again. Uh, same issue is going to be similar yet less physically demanding <laughs> in a uh, opposed game. And I mentioned this with my uh, friend Clueless Dave uh, as an example, although I haven't heard from him in forever. But, uh, you know, basically everybody checks, hey, what am I doing? Am I doing a start empire this turn, starting from the person with the start player thing and then just working your way around and everybody who does has to announce yeah that's what I'm doing um, all right oh, poor gray has to do something to improve themselves and I don't think they're doing I think they're doing a maneuver or something so they're kind of stuck in this dark age here things have gotten interesting enough I want to take a pause to talk about them I didn't take a break uh, over here we have the Guptas started up. Hey, this is a Gupta game. Uh, don't tell them part. Anyway, uh, not much that happens with them, but they're in kind of this nice little area where nobody is. Great. And they get points for India as well as if they spread over the world. So they're going to create some glory each turn. That's fantastic. Of course, they're stuck in a dark age too because they started at the zero level penalty. Purple did not start an empire here. They've got a destiny card in hand, or chip in hand. So they're not going to get to do that. But then I come over to the red pinks, and they're starting a new empire uh, with the step nomads. Now remember, they still get to do another action, right? So getting the most pieces, uh, most empires out on the board is really an advantage. There's going to be a sort of a rush to try to get that third empire and get the black set of pieces on the board. The step nomads aren't terribly uh, they don't have a city until, uh, the ability until four. They get elite ability, which presumably does something during combat. Again, you know, I forget all the rules when they just blur by like they did. Uh, they're going to have cheaper cav. Uh, but here's the biggie. Their income, their initial money is the age times seven. So they started off with like 21 bucks, and that's what I really wanted to zoom in on. The other thing is, although they're interested in being the top, uh, dog in Asia in terms of territories they may not make that oh here's the other thing they get a free maneuver action immediately uh, on their first turn and more than that if uh, you liberate a land from them on this first turn you lower another um, the other empires uh, progress by one so I can kind of pick on these browns what are they the Magyars there I can pick on them, knock off some of their stuff. It's not in Asia, but I should be able to gain enough Asian stuff off my maneuver that that helps. But beyond that, I also get a glory for every conflict that I win against another player. So maybe I actually want to take more than one thing. Plus, well, those guys don't have any cash, so sacking their capital may not be a terribly valuable thing. But we are going to see a more interesting turn than we've seen yet so far in terms of an action because they get the movement right afterwards and we're in a position where conflict's going to start. Okay, right, well, here's the maneuver position I took. I'm not 
quite sure I want to be in the steep steps there. However, I kind of like a continuity for one reason or another. I'm not sure quite why. And they are cow, but I could throw them out into uh, Turkestan instead. They'd have a better defensive factor there. The steps are terrible with no defense compared to the mountains with three, and they both have the same income. However, the mountains provide a penalty of one to the value to the calf. So I'm going to put the calf there. Now you notice I swept through here. I got two to one odds on these guys so I can move through here. Um, and I moved through here to here, here to here. But this is important because I'm going to be crossing a river. Now let's try to handle the combat as best as I can understand it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to pick this one first, well, for no great reason. Actually, I want to take uh, further back first. So I want to take this one first so that I'll have a place to retreat if I win that and I lose one of the others. Neither side can examine the other stack. Both sides draw a card for combat. So this is going to be Brown's card and he gets a one. And red has a zero. That's pretty crappy. Now, Brown has to put his unit in front, and we know this. Unfortunately, we also know we don't have a whole bunch of things here that can fight. So if we look at how you determine the, ca the total value, it's going to be frontline value, support value of uh, the other half the units, the elite marker will give me a plus one. Now, somewhere I remember there's something about if you lose the battle, you lose an elite marker. Yeah, you lose an elite marker if you lose the battle. So I kind of want to win the battle. <sighs> I know I'm going to face him with just this. Now, if I come in there with five plus four is nine, I should win this battle. So I'm going to throw everything in. Because that gives me a total of plus 10. Even though I have this crappy little card. Because all he's going to have is his 2 there. Um, and there's no defensive terrain. No elephants. So we're going to throw everything in. And indeed, as we noted, we win. Now these cards just get discarded. I guess there's reshuffles if you have them. This is defeated. Now let's look at what the effects are. First of all, I get a glory point. If I can find my right piece. To put there. Um, for having taken a land away from someone else. But now, lower Empire's progress by one if you liberated a land from it this turn. As far as I can see, and I can also vacate areas uh, before turn four, which normally you can't do. You have to maintain uh, one piece per space, which I don't think I explained. Um, I think I only affect them once, but their progress goes down by one. There's also a modifier for age, but it's not single boxes. You have to be a full age above uh, the other person to get a bonus. All right, uh, when I said there was no reason to attack the city, well, maybe there isn't, but there's also no reason not to, really. And maybe I'm taking some points away by doing that. So, uh, the defender has a three-point card. Now, I don't know this, and the attacker has a big seven-point card. That's a huge card. But again, I know he's got to face me with two. I'm throwing it all in. There's just no harm to it. And again, I win, defeat the enemy, I take his city away, boom. If he had any money, it would disappear, and I would get half of it in my empire. Now, is this the right color? Yeah. Some of the colors, it's hard to tell. I get another glory point for that. As I've taken another territory. Oh, we're kind of rampaging here. And now coming here, we're probably going to throw it all in again. Uh, you might have asked, well, why didn't you attack further? I could have gone one, 
two, and then, you know, maybe used a couple of these units that I had as access to make an attack into here across the river. Or Cav, well, Cav isn't going to make it here. River, I don't think, affects movement cost. It does not, but it does affect um, the defense value. So let's see, that. I guess this is the defender card I just drew here. Ooh, that's nice. And the attacker, nice enough. And again, knowing that he only has one guy, I'm going to throw everything in. Uh, that's going to be 8 in the primary line. I believe you round up there. 13 to 2 to 8. I'll make it 14 because of that, but 1 for the river as well. Anyway, it's another victory here as we're just destroying uh, the Magyars and we get another point of glory. We don't keep reducing the Magyar technology. But now they're becoming kind of a questionable kingdom at this point. They created some, po some victory points early on, but now they've just been swept aside. And that was the start empire action for the red side onto the blue. All right, a couple new empires show up. Put Alfred on top of these things. Just um, I may have, I've basically forgotten what he can do. Tactician makes him good at warfare. Administrator good at buying things. Great. All right, we have some. Uh, it's kind of annoying that there's blue on the leaders and blue on the pieces. I understand they've got to use a lot of different colors for the counter mix to make this game work. <clears throat> but, uh, I don't know quite, I don't know what the answer would be. Maybe some white pieces, <laughs> you know, some uncolored for the leaders because white doesn't seem to get used at all in this game. Um, so we got some North American uh, Plains Indians and then we got another one, ah, over in Ireland. Uh, I had another option instead of Ireland, uh, which was one of those generics, which might actually have been better. Ireland doesn't look terribly valuable here. Neither one feels very good to use a whole counter mix on. But you know, you can always put an empire in decline in this as you, and it's not necessarily that costly. You can just, it takes the empire's action, then it's discarded, and now you have, you know, your free action again. And this may be, enabling them by playing another one to get that third empire into play. If they time things right, they might be able... See, here's the thing. You start an empire, you get that third empire. Well, when you put it in discard, then whoever's the first player for the next turn gets to start an empire. So you might be able to time things so that you get to start empires that you like by discarding when the guy just before you is going to go. Of course, there's that, oi, it's my turn, ah, oh, card. Okay, now we come to where the interesting point is, which is geez, that guy over there. Oh, he's also starting an empire, and he has two choices, Benin and the Arabs. Benny and the Jets. Uh, the Arabs, wow, big seven-point card, and they really like age three. I get... Uh, I have two special leaders in age three, and we'll talk about them in a moment. I have a nice trade bonus, especially in ages three and four of plus two. My cav is cheaper. Uh, I get bonuses in deserts for both income and uh, harvest and glory. Um, in age three, I get an elite marker if I start then. And then I also get two free maneuver. So I get to spread in a way that I wouldn't with Benin. Now both of these can come in in later ages as well. Uh, so I'm probably gonna go with the Arabs, even though Benin may be able to produce me more points because it's gonna have homeland in Africa and well, perhaps the world, the money is not very high. What's really cool about this is every time I gain progress in trade, I get another glory point. So it is very appealing, but on the other hand, so is the Arabs, and oh, there goes, oh, it's my go. Okay, so the Arabs have two different leaders. One is Muhammad, and you would think Muhammad is going to be pretty damn potent. First of all, he's a philosopher, which means if he ties for glory points, he'll be getting 
the points as though he's ahead. Uh, as long as the other umpire doesn't have a philosopher. And then the religion is going to be, during a destiny pick, he discards to the bottom of the discard pile, and then has the option to either pick from the top of the pile or from the top of the discard pile. That could be very, very powerful, especially since there might be random cards on there from conflict or something. But there also might be cool cards that someone else has played. You have to kind of maybe keep track of what's been played. Maybe you can paw through the deck. Uh, the other one is a scientist. Now, scientists are also interesting because they allow you to play two cards during a trade in progress. And after the cards are revealed, you get to decide which one you really played. Which might allow you to play for the win... And then if you still didn't get that, play a really crappy card so that, you know, uh, if you don't get the win, you don't spend anything on it. Both of those are very appealing uh, options. I think I'm going to go with Muhammad. Uh, mainly because I'm not sure trading is going to be my first choice. But, wow, I like both of these. I'm going to put him over here or somewhere. Uh, anyway, I'll finish set up, but I want to keep him available because on the next turn, if I do a Civilize, I could promote the additional leader. I'm only allowed one free leader uh, in the Start Empire, but then I'll be allowed another one if I do a Civilize. One of the problems is I have this Elite Marker and I should be really awesome and everything. The thing is... I can't get very far because I'm not allowed to leave my territories. I'll leave my cav here and move infantry forward, I guess. Not quite sure where to move. I want to come into conflict with other people. I think this is probably my richest uh, territory. I've moved down and grabbed an elephant. That means next time I produce, I can buy that sucker. He just costs the same as any other cavalry. And they're very potent in combat. Not so much any uh, in anything else. Um, up until like and through era six, they're still very potent combat units. Then in age seven, I think they be become discarded completely as to any value um, when you're able to get nukes in Star Wars and such. But wow, <laughs> you know, um, they basically eliminate the entire strength point of the front line of the enemy in a round that they're committed in the front line. Oh, we got one more player, and I bet he's got an empire to pick. The final player in terms of gaining a new empire is going to put the Mongols out into play. They don't get a city to begin with. Um, this was something of a choice because, well, I actually had these uh, Chavin Mochicas uh, who start in Peru if the Incas aren't in play in era three. Not a lot of money. I'd be competing directly with that thing, and that didn't seem like too big a, an option. More interesting was the Seljuks. Maybe if the uh, Muslims hadn't shown up here, they would be of some, well, the Arabs. They're not Muslim yet, even though they've got Muhammad in charge. Uh, they start back here and kind of want to get into first place in Asia and Africa, and of course they're also kind of interested in uh, being the biggest Muslim power. <sighs> With 20 bucks, yeah, they could be kind of big, but they just weren't going to do too much damage cutting through. So I decided they're not as interesting as the Mongols, who have humongous amounts of abilities. First of all, I've got to look at my leaders. I'm going to get Genghis. I'm sure he's got Tactician at least. I'm going to have an Elite Marker. Cavalry only costs two initially. I get two free maneuvers. I can leave territories uh, before age four. Whenever I attack someone and beat them, I lower their progress by one. I get glory for being the biggest in the world, the biggest in Northeast Asia. I'm not sure how likely that's going to be. That's this chunk over here. We're going to have to face Korea for that. Uh, but two for the world, one for holding my, my home area, but here's the really cool one. Every land in every city 
I liberate from a more advanced empire gives me an additional glory. And any empire that somebody discards that's adjacent to me gives me an additional glory. So this is a really warlike society, not surprisingly, and it's going to have a fairly hefty effect on things. Unlike in history of the world, I don't want to send my Mongols into China because territory is not the important thing. My glory is gained by sweeping out and conquering things. So if there's no enemy to conquer, well, why bother? <laughs> Let's go for something else. Um, this might be able to help my Saxons break out of their kind of ugly situation. Although I don't think I'm going to make it as far as the Baltic in this turn. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me fish out Muhammad and other things in Genghis. Uh, these grand conquerors, they're all the same, right? Whether they form a religion devoted to peace or not. Let's see what he's got. Uh, first of all, he's got the tactician advantage, which we've looked at, but he also has strategist. I forgot about this one. After our empire has finished moving and resolving conflicts during maneuver, including multi each multiple move, uh, any units stacked with the strategist may move and resolve conflict another time. They can only move if they remain stacked with the strategist throughout the move. I should be able to make some big headway here. Let's build us some armies and I'll show you what happened What happened afterwards. This is my first move. Um, I'm kind of deciding not to go after the Koreans. I could try to wipe them out, but with them not spread out, that doesn't seem terribly valuable to me. Uh, I'm much more interested in gaining lots of territory and knocking out the people who look like they're going to be big. Basically, I can try to button them in uh, up there. I want to hold Mongolia, so I'm leaving a guy there. I don't really need to. At this point, I can always move him back later. So I'll actually uh, put the extra infantry up here. Um, likewise, if I'm just buttoning somebody in... Yeah, I won't be able to get back there with everything. Okay, so I'm going to open up with my attack over here. Not so much because, well, basically because if I wipe this out, then I have a retreat spot for here. Then I go to here, etc. Because I don't have anything controlled in the back areas. Remember, I can leave those areas. Um, let's take a look at what the cards are going to be. Now, let me think. The tactician... If he doesn't like his first card, he gets to draw a replacement. And committing it is something special, uh, like committing troops. So the defender is going to draw his card. I don't know what that is, but I get to draw mine. And this is a decent card. I'm going to go with it. Uh, how big do I want to go? That's always an interesting question. So, I think I want to commit everything <laughs> because I'm not facing a very big enemy. And now the question with the enemy is, what do I want to commit? Now remember, if I don't commit everything, I can retreat and that might be to my advantage. I've got a decent sized card. Um, I have to commit one unit. I don't think I'm going to be able to face Genghis, so I'm going to commit just this unit. Now I find out at this point that Genghis has committed everything. And here I have six, eight. He didn't have to cross a river. This blue line is just a demarcation of the zones. It's these little blue that would have been a river. But I'm facing, uh, let's see, you got to kind of figure out what you want where. Front line, well this is definitely not going to be front line. These two are definitely going to be front line. So I got to commit one of these to there and one of these to there. So I've got seven 8, 9, 10, uh, 8, 9, 13, and Genghis is committed, so if I 
get tied, I don't lose anything. That's 13 plus 4 is 17 to 8. I beat this. All right, but I haven't won the battle yet. And I'm going to get a disorder marker, which causes some problems. Does the enemy want to keep fighting me here, or does he want to give it up? Giving it up is going to hurt him technologically. I got to That's the unfortunate thing. When I first read the rules, disorder doesn't sound like it does anything except allows people to retreat. Then I remember finding a rule on disorder. Not in here, not in this big pile of crap that's in this example. But I thought maybe it was in here, but I'm not seeing it there. I'm not seeing an effect in the combat value, which is what I thought I found somewhere. And I have no idea. I mean, I know there was another effect to disorder because I found it, but I cannot find it in the rolls. And this is the hell of these rolls. Um, <laughs> I have no fucking clue what the effect of that disorder marker there is. I know it's a bad thing. Now here on the negative side, these guys can't withdraw because I'm not disordered. So they're gonna have to fight another round and probably get destroyed. But now I gotta spend time trying to look through the rules to find something that I may have glimpsed once, that I remember glimpsing once, but I do not remember when I read the rules and I have no idea what they are. I probably explained it to you because I think I found it when I was looking, when I was explaining the rules to you. And now, no idea where it's from. And there's no way to find it in these fucking rules. What is in this chart here? I had to look over in this humongous example to find where it would be. The best front line and support value used by units you committed this round for each disordered marker your enemy has acquired. The other thing is retreat you can only retreat if the other empire has a, a disorder. So the fact that I hit Genghis with one means that I'm going to get an advantage there. So I basically can double my force if I stand and fight. I know what he's got. I know what his value is. Three, seven, and six is 13. Um... And I can beat that. He's going to outdraw me, though. The reason I can beat that is I'm essentially doubled. I'm a 14 here. But he gets a double draw. Do I want to take my chance here, or do I want to just withdraw from combat? If I withdraw from combat, I lose a level of, uh, of progress. And now we got to look over at whatever these are. Not going to create any bonuses. Uh, I'm not going to get any uh, any additional points for knocking this guy out. What I'm going to knock out is some of these colors here, wherever they are. There's just so many colors on the map. I should have probably been heading down towards one of these guys. I can get more points off of, but whatever. Um. So I don't know. I don't really know which way I want to go with this. Let me think some more. I thought for any reason the Mongols were not going to play all their pieces. I would definitely go and, and go another round because I'd be going 14 against maybe half their force. But I'm pretty damn sure they're going to commit everything and they can commit Genghis again. He doesn't become tired. Uh, e e even if I hadn't used all my forces, I could use Genghis in every round. The problem is I could lose him in a round <laughs> and then I wouldn't have him anymore. So the thing is, I'm going to be going into this with plus one. If he gets two bad draws, uh, well, if I get a bad draw, I may not play both my units. So I've got some protection there. You know what? I'm going to stick around and uh, we're going to assume Genghis is going to... Uh, Probably be using all his forces. Six is a damn good card. They only go up to seven. He's going to stick with that. 
So now the question is, well, what do I do? Oh, geez, all I got is a one. 14 plus one is 15. He stuck with a card. I know he didn't stick with anything less than like a three. I am just gonna put my chariot in the front line. And now what that's gonna do is that's going to let me mark these off. That's going to kill the chariot, of course. And I'm going to find where that goes. And now I'm going to withdraw because I pretty much, even though he's got a, a second disorder marker, I don't know if that's going to do a damn thing for me because my best front line and support values, well, my best front line, I have to commit this to the front line, it's a zero. My best support, he doesn't actually get his support in that case because he's not a supporting unit. So we're gonna drop back to here, try to keep our existence in line. And that means Genghis has succeeded. He has taken my territory, which means I lose a point of progress. And this goes back somewhere in the one's pit. All right, I'll resolve the rest of the combats uh, for this round of combat, but remember, then Genghis gets his strategy move, and then I get a second full move, and Genghis gets another strategy move with his next pile, with his pile stuff. Next round, Genghis threw, he had like seven points of stuff up against three, but a big swing in the points, and you can see those, whatever they are, step guys, won the battle. Now that puts us to this battle, where the defender only has a two, but my cav is all reduced by one, which means I have two, four, seven, eight, nine against them. But I'm gonna fight. I'm counting on being able to throw everything in. So Genghis has swept through down here, avoiding the Moldavia space because there's so many units there. And it doesn't even help me to wipe someone out. I can only get points if, I, if someone uh, discards their empire that's adjacent to me. So I had to kind of be careful to hold this territory. I've got little splotches of territory running through the steps right now. But I've also knocked Brown down to where, geez, they don't have much they want to do either. Wish they had a wild card on that empire so that they could de um, uh, decline it at this point because it is really not valuable now, of course. By the time that they actually do discard it, Genghis may be gone from here. These red units, there's enough of them that maybe they can do something of value with whatever... Uh, well, they're newly created, so, oops, they were elites. They're no longer elites. Uh, they would have lost that in the first battle. And that's from period two, so that goes in that pile. All right. Uh, and Genghis lost his elites, too. Although maybe he wouldn't have if I had had, uh, cause he lost a battle back here. I don't think you gain elites except through cards, as far as I know. God knows. <laughs> I mean, it's just so hard to find anything in these rules that, as far as I know, you don't. You could just have multiple chits worth of them. Okay, that has put us through to essentially the production phase. And now I've got to look through everybody and see if anybody's doing production or wants to in order. And likewise throughout the rest uh, of the choices. Now you can do something kind of tricky, like if there's an empire... That you, if you want to start an empire, but you also want to do a destiny action, you could put the destiny action on top of an empire. And people think your empire is doing something, but it isn't really. Just as kind of a, hey, that's kind of neat. All right, 
right, so now the first player actually uh, with his Chimu over here has done a production tech uh, uh, action choice. And what we do is we just count up his provinces. He's got three forests, nothing special going. I'm sorry, those are jungles, not forests. Um, not a big difference there, heavier defense and movement point costs. Oh, wait. Uh, aircraft, etc. Same as in the forest. Okay. So, um, with three of them, that's worth six bucks. And two mountains, seven, eight, nine, ten bucks. And then this brings me up to eleven bucks. So I'm up to thirteen there. Money is worth a victory point to me if I can beat the top in the line. Now, I don't know whether other people who are competing in money are going to get there. For example, Korea is interested in money. So, you know, maybe I have to guess. But if I rank above everybody at this point, who the hell are these? The Irish have a ton of money. Why do they have so much money? They started with only 12. This can't be right. They must have spent that. Let me see. Uh, they bought, they have no special abilities here for what they bought. So they started with 12. They bought themselves a ship, which is five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. They should have spent all their money. I just only spent the boat or something. All right. Uh, um, so if I can get myself uh, around five or so, I'm probably okay. But now I got to pay maintenance. One, two, three, four, five. And you can see that drops much of my cash so I'm not going to get a lot of expansion if I want to get victory points here at this point. Now how much does expansion really matter? Well if I'm the biggest in the world that's a big deal and right now I'm not far. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, for the Arabs. Um, our Mongols are at two, four, five, six and I'm here at five. Now I'm not going to be able to expand and, and be the top of the world at this point, or probably, or any better, bigger than I am, but that's okay. Ooh, the canals actually appear in particular ages. That's kind of cool. That doesn't, the rules don't seem to indicate that. So, I don't know. Um, and that actually bugged me when I read the rules, but on the map it seems to be clear. All right, I have nothing special here. So, really the question is, how much of my money do I want to spend? And uh, Probably not a whole hell of a lot. Since I'm the first player, I can actually drop all the way down to four bucks without a problem. That'll be four bucks of money. Uh, now I gotta check my technology. I'm not up to those heavy infantry. So, what is it? We keep switching between place to place to try to see if we have anything on the card or in this one place where it gives them costs for units. Um, obviously, you can have player aids that help you with this. But yeah, basically, I have the choice between a missile or a calf. What kind of missile can I buy? Just the basic. I'm not up to that yet. Uh, cav. I could get up to a horse. I can't buy cav. <laughs> so I'll spend three bucks and build myself and I'll build it in my capital. I think I can build it anywhere, but I'm not sure. I guess if I pull my rule book and cover the map with it. Because the game takes up too much space. Kind of reminds me of, uh, well, obviously EU takes up this kind of space, but also 
But in terms of kind of this lighter type of game that takes up way too much space is uh, uh, Lords of the Sierra Madre, which I got kicking around somewhere up here. Uh, really eats up a table and you kind of need an auxiliary table or a lot of card tables or something for people. Let's see what's up with this production. Building new units. God, I'm tired. You can only place as many units as the value of the city in the area, so I have to build there during regular production now. Of course, I assume under Build and Set Up Empire, uh, that may not be required. <laughs> I don't know. doesn't seem to have an exemption to that, but I mean the game wouldn't make any sense if you couldn't build a reasonable starting force. Um, anyway, that's how I'm gonna run it. Uh, and that's it for that production. I'll, look through see if anybody else has production these guys had production and they made two bucks have to pay one for their unit unfortunately i think i had a horse archer here in one of the battles before and didn't really pay any attention to the fact that one of these little special abilities marked here in this whole sequence plus two to horse archers frontline value in ages one to three i guess it's just you know there's too much to keep track of for me. Um, it, I would probably miss out on some of those because the cards are so unreadable that I probably wouldn't remember and my eyes wouldn't be directed to those special abilities quite often, even if I was playing this opposed. Um, And that gets us through the production, so now we go to trade and progress, and we definitely have some. Okay, so, these champs here have trade and progress, and they have special rules. They'll earn income from winning a trade equal to the difference between the total trade values. They have nothing else, no leaders or anything that seem to affect this. <clears throat> okay. So now I'm going to be, my distance right now is second age so it's only two spaces and it says two spaces between but they really mean two spaces too you can have one blank space between um, I'm gonna be playing a card and then drawing a random card that I'm gonna be facing now as to the card I want to play and I have a trade value of E0 whatever E might mean uh, I think it means special, but I don't know. Let's find out because I gotta go spend time looking through the fucking rules to try to find what that means. And I know it's not. It. If it means anything, they would have told me somewhere. <laughs> I'm just reading it as a misprint on the rules or something. I have no idea. So under leaders, there's an E2. What the fuck? What does E mean? I look over here. The only place where they talk about this shit at all is in this picture. And there's no indication of E in here that I can see. Of course, I don't like reading pictures. But in the rules, there's no description of what the fuck the card, how to decipher the cards. It's just kind of embedded in this. It's like, it's as if um, the, the Australian Design Group and, and Rollin... Uh, went and said, geez, you know who's really popular at writing games that kind of reach a bigger audience? Martin Wallace. Let's copy his rules style. Because maybe if we make our rules that bad, people will like our games more or something. I mean, this really is a Martin Wallace style rulebook. Like the worst of the Martin Wallace rules. It's not quite up to uh, an Ackland rulebook, but it's close. Well, I have no idea what those E's mean. And I have no idea how to find out. I'll look up E here. 
Maybe that uh, tells me something. I mean, you know, what the fuck? You'd think they'd try to make the game playable, but I'm assuming it's a typo or something. So, or it just means there's some special effect here. Or maybe it's E for earn. I don't know. <laughs> But it's not explained anywhere I can fucking find. All right, so here's the thing. I wanna put a good bit in here, but I don't really wanna use my Italians up. They look like they could be useful. I know my Sumerians are not, but they have this vital air. If I could conceivably ever play something against someone, against this guy this would be useful if he remembered that he has a defensive card but I probably will never get to play it on the other hand the Pope I don't think did much for me I already know Confucianism didn't impress me too much uh, and the pirate states doesn't look valuable either so I'm gonna throw this four down and I get a trade of plus zero with that. So if I get a low vote, and I do, I get a three. Okay, so I think this goes in my hand and this gets discarded. I think that's what happens. I think you automatically trade the items. Okay. Yeah, you keep the card that... Uh... So, I won. Now, that increases my progress marker by one, and I'm pale pink, if I can find them. Now I'm in a dark age. That's not good. I hope I get to go further. Uh, I chose trade in progress, so I can choose to increase in another level. I'll do that. And now I can choose to increase to another level if I traded with an empire that started a higher progress, but that didn't happen. But I also won a trade, uh, I won income from a winning trade equal to the difference between the total trade values. That difference was one, but that means I get a buck if I can find the right shit for that in these piles. And kind of this pinkish purple. That's me. Um, now that's... Uh, crap. That's kind of important because he gets a bonus if he ends up the highest in income in total uh, cash on hand. Well, I'm going to have to cut the camera so that I can stack those because these counters are too slick to do it one hand. All right, that was the last of the trade cards. Now we go to people who have a destiny pick. Now, I know for a fact where these are. They're going to be these guys who didn't create an empire this time. Um, so that should be pretty easy. And basically, you just have the choice of, geez, do you want to hold on to these cards or not? And that's kind of going to be tough to think about. So I'm going to have to think about the cards I have, discard them, and draw new cards. It's not necessarily the case that high value is all that's important. So wait, I had this. I can, I can initiate another trade. Oh, crap. Okay, I want to do this because I don't want this card in my hand because it'll reduce my... I want to do this before, you know, back when I did that trade, <laughs> right? So now I do another trade. And I'm, again, at a pretty good rating. You know what? I don't think I'm going to need this. I don't know if I really need the Italians, but I know I don't need the Sumerians. So I'm going to do that, and I'm going to pull another one of these. And oh crap, I got Polynesians. That means I broke even on my trade. So I'm not going to get anything for that. Uh, because I didn't win the trade, except I get the Polynesians. All right. And now I hope I didn't just dump a card there. The cards, too, are slick. Now, I have to look through these cards and decide what I want to keep and what I don't, because this is the first guy who's going to have the Destiny card. Now, I'm not thrilled with a lot of my cards, but it's hard to decide I want to get rid of something. So Polynesians, eh, they don't look impressive to me. 
They want a lot of coverage of the world. They want a lot of boats. But they don't start with much money, so it seems unlikely I'm going to get those kind of gains. So they seem like good bait, but they're worth five points in a, a trade bid. I'm going to toss them, though, because I don't think they're worth much overall. Then the next question is, okay, if I keep the Khmer, one of the things they want is monuments. And, hey, I've got a monument that I could play on them, and that would get me two victory points a turn if I keep that connection. On the other hand, if I play the Moors, I would want cities, and I could kind of aim uh, towards urbanization type picks, which would be the same uh, choice, the uh, civilized pick that I'd need to take for the Khmer's to get their two points for the monument. The disadvantages, well, the Moors are only interested in Europe and their home area, which would be Mauritania. They can probably get Mauritania. I'm not so sure they can get first or second place in Europe. The Khmers are going to be down here in Cambodia, right up against someone. They're interested in Southeast Asia. I may not be able to hold on to them. These are both kind of crappy cards in a couple of ways. I'm going to pitch them. I'm going to draw, even though I kind of want to start a new empire, and I'm going to draw five new cards, and we'll see if I got lucky here. Because I've got one, so I can go up to six. And at least I got something that gives me a new kingdom that I could play. Another one. You hit tights, I'm not going to be able to play. Unfortunately, I threw away a better card point-wise than any of these. And I kind of like the Italians and wanted to hold them, but I'll probably end up doing trade with them. Now, if I recall correctly, I'm not sure if you can pick the same element that you picked on an earlier turn. See, unfortunately, actions are described here, but then they talk about what happens after you've picked them. So now we have to look somewhere else to see where you actually did the picking, which is up here. Sort of. Kind of. And something in my head says maybe you can't pick the same action twice in a row for the same kingdom. But man, I can't find it looking through here and I'm not sure that it's correct. So again, like a lot of things in this game, I've got this vague idea. Well, maybe the second action is just the you can't pick two of the same action from your pile. So I, I think you can repick the same action, which would mean that I can keep doing trade with this and I can keep doing whatever the hell it was I was talking about. Well, maybe that is what I was talking about. All right. We'll see if anybody else has trade in property. All right, let me change that to we'll see if anybody else has destiny. And nobody does. Uh, so we go to the civilized action. Well, no, ha somehow I missed the fucking maneuver action on here. I am so goddamn tired. All right, well, I'll catch them up. It's no biggie. I'm not going to remember to check that guy for any action cards in case he gets in a fight. So it doesn't much matter. <laughs> He's sort of out of it anyway. Nobody's going to be harassing him. So now I'll go through everybody and see if they have maneuvers just because I can't take a break now because I've screwed up the order there. And just about everybody who's on the board does have maneuvers. So I'll come back after I've moved all of them unless something exciting well, our Danes are our first option. They've got kind of a problem because they're really outnumbered by the Saxons. And ah, my goals with the Danes, I could probably sit there in Denmark and not lose anything and get a victory point per turn. But if I move two guys to Britain, that's worth a point. And if I get people outside of Europe, that's worth a point. And these might be, being outside of Europe might be safer. Now, do I have any special abilities here? Yes, I can enter oceans with my galleys. I also get to count tundra when I'm harvesting glory. So that's a place I could go hide. Uh, in ages two and three, each 
land liberated from a more advanced empire lowers that player's progress by one so I can go vikinging um, in order to do this I have to find my color which is this pink on here it's really hard to see the stacks uh, where your you know position in the stack is when everybody's kind of clustered together so I think I want to sail out and I'll do that. alright so one option would have been to just land everybody in Ireland. Instead, I have to land my ships uh, with the units. And by the way, you can't move the units again after. You, I, I thought maybe you could move land units afterwards. The way the naval transport is stated, they have to start the maneuver action in the same area and move together for the whole action. So I can't split apart. Anyway, in addition to grabbing two British spaces, I've also sailed out to, Ire uh, uh, to Iceland and to Greenland. Now these are both European territories. I have to make it to North America uh, to get any further and I'm probably going to lose Denmark, my home area for this and only end up getting one victory point for the English territories. Assuming the Saxons don't land there which would be really bad for me. Alright well let's see what we had here. Uh, Pink did a maneuver. We did them. The next one is something kind of blue, which would be the Koreans, and you can see they knocked some of the Mongols out of the way. Over here, the Goths kind of streamed in, killing mainly uh, steppe stuff, but they actually attacked the Mongols here too and drove some of them back at losses. That puts them in pretty strong position elsewhere. Oh, what that that says production. So they did not. Here, uh, that's who I'm on. I'm on the Saxons at this point. Um, and this is kind of problematic. I got big stacks of Saxons. I want to get to Britain, no question. Okay, well, I'm allowed to carry two land units on each ship, and that's about all I really have going for me. Uh, I have a no castles less than three. I'm in level three. Um, so I'd like to do this naval invasion, and I'm trying to find out where the hell I found. Uh, I'm pretty sure I found a rule saying naval invasions have some kind of penalty. Or maybe something that said they don't get the penalty. Um, so it's not under sea and it's not under ocean. Is there some kind of coastal? No. There's crossing arrows which have an effect. If you're crossing a river or crossing arrow, and maybe that's what it's supposed to be. When I look in the combat rules itself, I can't find it. Uh, here's the list of these. The terrain modifier on the terrain chart. Um, I didn't find anything else here. Ah, there we go. If any moving force unit invaded this area. Unfortunately, that's not listed in here. <laughs> They decided to put some rules only on the map and not in the rule book itself just to make life just a little bit more fucking annoying when you're playing this game, right? Okay. Um, it's going to be tough to fight in these hexes or spaces. And that's kind of the problem. I'll have to send a pretty big force to do that invasion. Now, Britain's important to me, but so is Europe. And maybe I'm better off fighting against those Goths to knock them out. Except the Vikings have like five areas in Europe because these count as Europe. They didn't really want to be here. The Goths have one, two, three, four. I don't think I can take um, that big on either of them. So I'm going to have to be kind of careful. Maybe I could just spread out all over the place and get first place in Europe. But I would really like to get Britain, so I'm going to try that naval invasion. And all these attacks that I've been making, I've completely forgotten to look at anybody's cards to see if they could do any kind of intervention. And every card has, you know, an event space in it that well might be something that 
would have saved, you know, well, we no longer have these brown guys here. They're going to go into decline. Um, you know, maybe they could have stayed on the board and been worth something. Who the hell knows? Trying to invade England was not going to provide me with much of an advantage. So instead what I did was spread out to five areas, including taking Denmark. One, two, three. Oh, wait, maybe one, two, three, four, five, six areas. Um, Well-fortified Poland, at least comparatively. I've got these nice catapults. They're kind of powerful. Taking an area away from the Vikings means I'll get first place in uh, that. And I think that's the end of the maneuvers. Now we do the de destiny that I was doing. Nobody did civilize. Nobody did discard empire. And now we go through counting the points. <laughs> Let's try to do these. Here in the South Americans, one. Most American, two. Most in the world, two, four, five, maybe. One, two, three, four, five, six. It might be second, though. Now, he's not going to get that. So he gets one, two. Does he have the most money? Yeah, somehow he got the most money. So he gets three glory. There. And now these Guptas. I'm in my home for one. I'm in the most India for two. Gets me two more quick points. Of course, these glories are the goal of the game. Over here to purple. I'll move these to remind me. Purple has these clams. Do I have my home? Yes, that's one. Southeast Asia, yes. Two. Am I in the running for money? No. So I go up to slick on slick socks. <laughs> Is that 80, late 80s, early 90s style, except this was done in like 2005 or something. All right, over here, my Vikings. What do we have? Home? No. Britain? Yes, we get a point. The world? Uh, we're at four. Okay, we gotta count everybody else. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's gonna be first. This is six for second. Third is over to yellow, so I'm not getting that. So let's count again. One, two. Do we have anything outside Europe? Not yet. So red goes up two. Okay, and then my step nomads, I've got one area in Asia. That's not going to give me top rank in Asia, so I'm not going to get any points off that. Over here for the Plains Indians, I'm in my home. Uh, I am second place in the Americas, so that gets them two points. Now, what color is this? This is blue. Hopefully, I can keep my money. Uh, and now these guys, whoever the hell they are, my Koreans. My Koreans are in their home. They're in Northeast Asia, that's two. What's their progress position? Well, they're the pale blue color. They're not in range for that. How about money? They're in second place for money, so that gets them a third point. And charges them forward. Over here for green, we have the Irish. They're not in first place in Britain. They don't have any Christian. All they get is one. This is their first point of the game. And now the Goths, are we in the top two positions for Europe? Well, maybe. The turn marker's here, so pink went, uh, I'm sorry, so pink, as opposed to lavender or whatever, uh, is actually beating them out. So I don't get anything there. So what am I doing? I'm on green. I don't get any more points. So this goes down here.
over here for the Magyars. They've disappeared, so they're not going to be worth anything. They pretty much are a non-existent empire. I've got to get rid of them. Uh, although it might be kind of cool to start a black empire on here and try to decline one, but I'm not sure that I'll get a chance to do so unless I have the Oi card, which I think I've already played here. So now for my Arabs, I'm in my home. How am I on the world? Oh, geez, maybe I'm the top in the world. Yeah, I'm the top in the world. So that's two points. No Muslim, nothing there. So browns go up two, and I've probably cheated and screwed something up. Okay. Over here. The Saxons, they want Britain and Europe. Well, they didn't get Britain, but they are number one in Europe, so that's worth two points to the gray player. I'll try to slide that in there. Very tight fits. And then the Mongols, Northeast Asia, I've lost my positioning there. Home, I have that, so that's a point. I'm not in the top couple for the world. So all I get for this is one point for my Mongols. And we've already done these. So that's the end of that turn. <laughs> and I don't know where I am. But we'll be starting the next turn, but I'll load this big old thing.